So uh, the Westminster Pond Center and, and the Signal Boost Initiative is supported by Candlelight and the Ontario Trilling Foundation is a program of Reforest London. And the goals of the Signal Boost Initiative is to be able to bring more environmental education opportunities to the general public within the London area. So we are very thankful to OTF, Candlelight and Reforest London for giving us the opportunity to bring these kind of events to you. All right, so now we will head into our presentation and I will turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Shaq, and thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, so as Shaq said, I'm Rachel. I'm the Neighborhood Relief Coordinator at Reforest London, which is a very fancy way for saying that I run our tree giveaway programs, among some other things at the organization. Um, if you got a tree from us this year, you might have seen me there handing them out. Um, and hopefully you'll see me again next year if you want to get more. I just want to let you guys know we do have some upcoming uh, Signal Boost Initiative um, events coming up. Um, Shaq informed me, however, that they are sold out, but we do have a waitlist function. So if you're interested in, in either of these, either this Saturday or next Saturday, there's two different times for these sessions, um, you can join our waitlist if you head to our website. All right, so tonight's workshop, um, we're going to talk about selecting the right tree, how to plant a tree. If you're here, you might have already planted one, but I'll, uh, I'll walk through some of the key steps so that when you plant your next one, we can make sure you do it right. Um, we'll talk about some tree care basics, a little bit of how to spot if your tree's dying, um, some common pests and disease, and a very brief little conversation about the London tree bylaw. And as it mentioned in the description of this event, we're going to be talking about overwintering your tree. Um, so that'll be in the tree care basics. I'll go over some winter specific uh, care, um, care for your tree for overwinter, getting it ready right around this time of year is a really good time to make sure that you have it all in tip top shape. So I'm going to start with talking about selecting the right tree. There's three main things you want to consider. Um, you want your tree to be a native tree or shrub to the region. You want to know your yard conditions and make sure they match with the tree that you're planting. And you want to make sure you choose the right size of tree for your yard that you're going to be putting it in. Uh, native trees are really important because they support local uh, habitat and help with our, our pollinators and wildlife that are already existing in the area. Um, you can get a local tree, a native tree, either from us at Reforest London, we give away free trees um, every year, twice a year in the spring and the fall. And then also you can buy some at local nurseries around the area like Little uh, Otter um, or Heeman sometimes has some really good native varieties as well. Uh, on our website, we have a list of some good nurseries that we work with that you can order trees from if you're looking to buy. Um, you can also reach out to me if you ever are looking for like you want eight trees for a large piece of property that you have or something like that, you can reach out to me um, specifically and we can discuss some options for ordering in some trees for you if you can time it with the spring or fall that we do our ordering. Um, the yard conditions, I'm gonna go over all of the yard conditions, how to know about them and so on and so forth in this presentation. Um, and then the size of trees really important. You wanna be mindful of your surroundings. Um, so you wanna look for any structures overhead like power lines, as well as your underground infrastructure. So you always wanna get an, a locate of the infrastructure and pipes and gas lines that you might have underground. Ontario One Call will do those for free for you on your own private property. So before you plant a tree, you should always get your locate done um, and make sure that you're not gonna hit any power lines. I just wanted to show you guys on our website and you can get one from us in person as well is this brochure here. This is a lot of really great information what I already talked about and expands on it about selecting the right tree um, for your property. And then we also have, it's very blurry here, but this is on our website as well, kind of a graph about all of the different native trees. So if you are gonna go out shopping, you can get this brochure online. You can double check it and make sure that you get the right tree when you're out shopping and that it's a local native tree. So when you're selecting the right tree, you want to make sure that you meet um, your, your conditions. We're going to talk about sunlight, soil type, and soil moisture. Those are kind of the big three that if you can capture the right uh, tree for those conditions, you're going to be in good hands. So sunlight, you can have full sunlight, part sun or shade. I think it's pretty self for straightforward. If you have full sun, there's sun all day. Um, part shade is maybe you'll get half sun in the morning or the afternoon. And then shade is if it's shady all day. 
A really important thing when you're looking at how much sun you have is to really make sure that you're catching the right time of year. So if it's the fall or the spring and you have other trees around you that haven't leafed out yet, it might not, um, you might think you have full sun and in a couple months you're going to have suddenly shade from a big tree next door. So kind of be mindful of, of what trees are going to leaf out around you. Um, and also to check at different times of day if you, you um, have like another building beside you. In the afternoon it might be shading the area that you want to plant in that wasn't shaded in the morning. So on and so forth. Um, having the right amount of sun is really important because trees need light to make food. Um, but they all have different requirements, just like our bodies do and different people do and different sizes of people do. So um, it's really important to make sure that they get the right amount of light. Um, and some trees are even very, very sensitive. They can get sunburns or sun scalding on their leaves from the light. So you want to make sure if it wants shade that you give it that shade. Um, the next main condition are your soil type. So do you have sand, clay, or loam? Um, these are some fancy terms. I have this graph here that'll show you, but I wanted to show you guys really quickly how to do a soil sample at your own house really, really easily so you can determine your soil type. Um, so I have like a little sample of it here. This one, oh, it hasn't settled. I took this today and I was hoping if I left it out, it would settle, but it didn't quite settle. You can kind of see I can't see the striations, unfortunately, but this image shows it really well. So to do a soil sample at your own house, you're going to take a mason jar, pop some soil in there and fill the rest of it with water. Since this one hasn't settled, I'll just give it a good shake, 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 shake. You're going to set this bad boy aside for like, I, you know, at least four hours. I did this this afternoon and it didn't settle. So probably about a day is your best bet to get a good layers. Um, and then and as you can see in this image here, you'll actually get all of the different layers settling separately. Uh, and then you'll do a calculation to determine what your soil type is. Once you've done that calculation, you'll go back to here and you'll, you'll see. So um, you can see in this one, the example one, it has 17% clay, 66% silt, and another 17% sand. So what I'm going to do is go back and we'll do, what was it? 17 clay, 66 silt. 17. So I'll go to the clay first and we know that it's about 17 clay. We knew that it was 66 silt. So I'm going across the silt and then sand was all the way over here to that 17. So we'll land about here and that would be a silty clay. Um, so there's some, some great resources online to help you with that calculation. But um, once you go back and look at this slide, you can see exactly see how to do it. Um, so that's a really quick, easy way to find out what soil type you have at home. Once you know your soil type, you'll be able to match it to what trees are going to be good in those conditions. Um, and it's super easy. So everyone can find out your soil type tomorrow. You could all go out and figure out what soils you have. Um, you want to look at your soil moisture as well as what type it is. So is it dry, moist, or wet? You want to look for, is it a low area? Does water collect there? Is it up high? You can kind of look for, is your soil cracking in the heat of the summer? Um, to give you a good indicator of how wet your soil is too, because certain trees will want different moisture conditions. Um, so those are the three main conditions. You want to make sure that you really take those into consideration and get the right tree for your site to make sure that it grows big, strong, and lasts a really long time. Um, sometimes if you plant a tree in the wrong conditions, it'll be fine for the first few years and then it'll die off or it just won't take right away. So if you've had some unsuccessful trees in the past, it might just be that they weren't getting the requirements that they need for where you planted them. Um, this is also a little blurry, but if you go to our Reforest London website and you go to our tree giveaway web page there, you'll see this chart. It's a quick little cheat sheet that we've put together about the common trees that we do at our giveaways and what the conditions that they want to have met are. Um, so once you know your conditions, you can head to our website, look at this nifty little chart and really quickly be able to determine what tree you should plant in your yard. Um, and it's actually, I think the list has gotten longer since I posted this photo. So if you go, you'll, you'll be able to get a good variety of trees to see which will do well in your area. So that's picking the right tree, pretty straightforward. If you're here, like I said, you probably already have a tree. So um, you've probably already planted one, but I just wanted to go through some of the key elements of planting a tree, just in case you've had some unsuccessful ones or are looking to expand in the future so that you know what you're looking for. You want to make a plan. We talked about that. You want to know your conditions, figure out where you're going to plant it. Is it going to get, get the right amount of sun that that tree wants? 
you're going to go out and buy the tree or get one for free from us. And then you're going to plant it very straightforward. Um, always, always call before you dig. Like I talked about, you want to know about any underground infrastructure. Um, some trees that you especially want to know this with are willow trees and silver maple trees. They're known to have some prolific root systems um, that aren't really good for water pipes. So most of the time, most trees are fine to plant. They're not going to ruin your sewage unless your sewage is already damaged or you have a willow tree because they really like to go for the water. Um, so you want to make sure you keep your trees away from that infrastructure. You can call before you dig Ontario One Call. You can literally call them or they have an online application really easy. Like I said, they're going to come out for free and mark all of your underground infrastructure so you don't accidentally hit your gas, vein, um, gas line or plant your tree too close to your water pipe. So always call before you dig. It's technically the law. All right, so we already talked about getting a nice um, native tree. You also wanna make sure it's local. So getting it from as nearby as where you're gonna plant it is really, really helpful. Typically um, the good local nurseries that we work with, like I said, they're mentioned on our website, but um, they all also grow from our seed zone. So you know that the seed was collected from the area near us grown in this area and then you're going to plant it again in this area so that tree is is really used to the conditions that it's going to continue to grow in which is really important for a good healthy um, surviving tree uh, and then you also healthy so when you're choosing a tree you want to check out that stem you want to make sure that it is nice and straight trunk that there's no major splits or scars that it has lots of with good leaves on it. You want to see that the branches are a little flexible. Don't go around breaking trees in the nursery, but give them a little bend. Make sure that this tree is springy. Um, and uh, if possible, you actually don't want to plant a tree once they're too big. Um, the younger, the better to put it in the ground. So typically, you know, a year might be too small for people to want to plant, but in that two to five year range, you know, no bigger than six feet is a really good size to get your tree at. Um, so if you're planting a seedling, here's how you plant it. Um, you want to plant it right away. Seedlings dry up quickly. There's not a lot of soil there to hold moisture. So plant it as soon as you get it, if you can. Uh, you're going to dig a hole two times as wide as the plug um, and then plant it so that it is as deep as the soil that the plug is already in, no deeper. And you want to make sure that none of the roots are exposed. Very, very easy. If you're doing a potted tree, there's a few extra steps here I'm going to go over. Um, so you'll remove the grass in the area of two times the diameter of the pot that your tree is in. And then you'll want to make sure that the depth of your hole is the exact same as the depth of the soil already in the pot. Um, but that there's a lot of width. You want it to be really wide. You're going to carefully remove the pot from the plant, not the plant from the pot. And you'll check the roots. So sometimes when you're getting a tree in a pot, it's going to be called pot bound. And so the roots will be growing in a spiral formation inside that, that pot. And you really want to make sure that you break them up from those spirals. Otherwise, when you put it in the ground, it's going to continue to spiral and it'll strangle at the tree. Your tree will randomly die in like 10 to 20 years. Um, so it's not very great. You want to make sure that they're not pot bound. So you're actually going to tease and massage and pull those roots so they're all facing outward from the main stem of the tree and not in a circle. Um, and then you'll set the plant back in the hole. You'll fill it in with the original soil and then you'll compress gently. It says here using your hands, but I typically just step in a circle all the way around the tree. Um, but I want to mention here, filling with the original soil. This is really important. You want to make sure that you put the soil from the hole back into the hole and not fill it with like new good gardening soil. Um, because you basically want the tree to be always growing in the conditions it's going to grow in. If you backfill your hole with new soil and it's way softer than like the clay soil that's around it, you've basically just made a pot in the ground. The roots are going to grow out until it hits that firmer clay soil and mm, they're going to take a turn and they're going to spiral. And once again, like I said a second ago, strangle that tree. So you want to, even if you think you have terrible clay soil, you want to put that soil that back into the hole, not in the new soil. Um, and like I said, your trees all have different conditions they want met. A lot of trees here in the Carolinian forest and in London are okay with clay. So it's okay to put that clay right back in. All right. So that's your, your basics of planting a tree. Um, 
now we're going to talk about some tree care basics. I'll start with the regular basics and then I'll talk about some overwintering tips to get you guys ready for the winter for your trees. So we're gonna talk about mulching, watering, protecting your tree, pruning and staking. The first one is mulching. So why do we mulch a tree? Mulch is great, great for a tree. Cannot emphasize this enough. Um, some of the key elements of why we mulch is that it helps reduce moisture loss. It helps control weed growth and it's gonna insulate the soil and protect roots from extreme summer and winter temperatures. So um, in the summer, when you have a wood chip mulch, for instance, over top of your tree, it's gonna be lighter in color than the dark soils underneath it would be. So when the sun hits in the hot, hot summer, it's not going to evaporate the water as fast in the soil because like I said, the mulch is lighter in color. Um, it's also gonna hold in moisture. So those wood chips, especially a wood chip mulch, it's gonna hold in moisture when it rains and release it back into the soil more slowly than if the water just went right through the soil. So it helps keep your tree watered during those um, summer months. I can get really droughty here in London. Uh, and in Ontario in general. And then in the winter, it actually acts as like an insulating protective barrier. So mulch is really great for your tree, especially in like its first, you know, five to 10 years of growth. Um, mulch also can improve your soil biology. It helps with the aeration of your soil. It helps keep your soil structure intact. It helps with your drainage over time. It can improve fertility. It helps um, the soil health as it decomposes. Um, and it inhibits certain plant diseases also at times. So, so many good things about mulch. Um, the different types of mulch that we recommend, I'm a big advocate for, for wood chips and if possible, um, cedar wood chips are actually really good because uh, they, they decompose more neutral than uh, a softwood wood, uh, other woods would. Uh, cedar is a softwood, but then a hardwood wood. Um, but some other types of mulch that you can use is um, stone. Sometimes people use pulverized rubber. You can use different geotextiles. Um, and then the organic types that you can use are wood chips, which are one of the best ones. Pine needles, which I would only recommend on top of a pine tree. Otherwise it might change, like I said, the composition of your soil. It wouldn't be good to use pine needles on a hardwood tree, but you can use pine needles on a pine tree. Um, you can also do like kind of a leaf litter and use that as a mulch. It's not as good as a wood chip, but it's still quite effective. Um, the good thing about the inorganic ones I mentioned, so stone rubber or geotextiles, is that they don't need to be replaced as often. Um, the organic ones, so wood chips, pine needles, leaves, need to be replaced a little more often, but they decompose and have much better benefits for the soil. So it just depends on what kind of maintenance level you're looking for. You want to surround the entire tree with a th uh, thick ring of mulch, so a couple inches high, about this thick. Um, but you want to avoid what we call a mulch volcano. So you don't want the mulch all pressed up against the tree, making a pyramid coming down from the base of it and all piled up high. You want it to be laying down flat, evenly laid out all the way around the tree. And you actually want to make sure that there's about five to 10 centimeters, um, or sorry, two to three centimeters where the mulch isn't touching the base of the tree. So you want to make a donut and pull that mulch away from the base of your tree a little bit, just to prevent too much moisture buildup right against the base of your tree. Um, and I always say to go about 10 centimeters out from your tree in a really good ring so that you don't have too many weeds coming in. Uh, with the wood chips especially, you're gonna wanna remulch them every year annually, um, up to 10 years old. And then, you know, once your tree's looking pretty established, you don't have to mulch anymore, but some people for the look of the landscaping do keep their trees mulched for a really, really long time. Dealer's choice at that point. Watering. So typically when you choose a good local native tree, you don't have to water all too much because they're used to the conditions. But when they're still young, you do want to water your tree. Um, so a newly planted tree is more susceptible to dry trans, uh, conditions from transplanting it. So um, in the spring and fall, you want to water your tree about once a week. Uh, in the fall, especially, you want to water your tree once a week until the ground freezes. In the summer, sometimes up to twice a week, you'll want to water it in the first year to three years after you've planted it. Um, 
um, so we recommend trickle watering. Um, if possible, you can do that with your hose where you turn it on. So it's literally just a drip at a time coming out of your hose. You leave it on top of where your tree is planted for about an hour. Um, if you don't have a hose long enough or have a hose or don't want to leave your hose on just in case, you can do this with a bucket. So drill really, really small holes into the bottom of the bucket fill it and then put it on top of the tree. Same thing, like picture a coffee percolator. You want the holes to be small enough that the water's just dripping out of them. And you can just leave the bucket on top of the tree and it'll trickle water as well. That's the best way to water your tree. Um, and yeah, so once basically from the time the ground thaws till the time the ground freezes in the first one to three years after planting, once a week, you're gonna water unless you have a really rainy week if you have a really dry week, you'll water twice. And then once they get older, like I said, if you have a native tree, they're used to our conditions, they're gonna be okay in the droughts. All right, protecting your tree. Protection is quite important. You wanna keep your lawnmowers and weed whackers at least a meter from the base of your tree. Weed whackers can be quite deadly to trees. If you get that bark at the base of the tree off of it with a weed whacker, it's as good as dead. So you really wanna keep different lawn tools away from your tree. Make sure that your children or your dogs aren't playing around your tree until the branches are well established. I've heard some stories of people's dogs just digging up their newly planted trees recently. So maybe put up a little protective barrier if you have a dog that likes to dig. Um, you don't want to trim your tree without kind of knowing what you're doing. So I'll talk a little bit about pruning later, but I'm going to emphasize a lot of times if you don't know what you're doing, don't prune your tree. You can watch some videos, you can learn a lot, you can do a bit of pruning, but if you're feeling uncomfortable about it, just don't do it. Uh, and you never wanna cut the leader of your tree right off the top of the tree. So the leader on a hardwood tree is the main leading stem. So it's basically your, your base of your tree, your, your, the main one. And then all the branches grow off the sides. Some people will say, oh, okay, if you want your tree to grow bushier, you can cut the leader off. That's terrible advice. Never do it. Never cut the leader off. It's really dangerous for the tree. It messes with how it grows its structure and it can lead to breakage um, and just your tree dying because it's really confused as to why it no longer has a top. Oh, I also had for protecting. Um, so one of the things that we use at Reforest London, we give them away with our trees and you can buy them at Home Depot and Canadian Tire as well, our tree collars have two different types to show you today. There's a third one, but I don't have one. You probably see them around the city trees. They're like the dark black or dark green ones that are wider and kind of graded. Tree collars are great. They're gonna prevent animals from munching on your tree. This one's really good, these green tubular ones uh, because a weed whacker can't get through these. So if you are ever weed whacking too close to your tree and you have a guard on it, it won't ruin your tree. And it's gonna keep your animals like your own dog or squirrels and stuff from munching on the tree as well. Um, so you wrap these around the base of your tree from the very base to wherever that first lowest branch starts and you'll leave them on until they fill the collar and then you can remove them and at that point your tree is hopefully established enough that it won't be as injured as easily. Oh, wrong way. So pruning, I'm going to talk a little about pruning um, but like I said, if you're ever unsure or not feeling confident about pruning your tree, I wouldn't recommend doing it. I'm going to give you a few little tips and tricks if you are feeling up to it. And there's a lot of really great resources on YouTube. And if you're interested, we actually have another webinar on our YouTube channel. And we run this one in person as well twice a year. Uh, it's a fruit and nut tree webinar all about taking care of fruit and nut trees. Um, with Jessica from Wildcraft Permaculture. And she goes really in depth about how to properly prune your tree. She specifically talks about fruit trees, but it's a very, very similar thing when you're getting into other trees. So if it's if you have fruit trees or you're really interested in learning more about pruning, um, I would recommend that as a starting point and to read more about it. But I'll, I'll give you guys a few tidbits of information because it's okay to remove a dead branch here and there from your tree. In fact, it, it is advised if it's dead. So. Rule number one, you never want to prune more than 25% of your tree at a time. It makes the branches and the leaves for a reason. They need it to grow. So never prune more than 25%. Um, and don't prune in the heat of the summer You can or in winter. So you can prune early spring, 
or early winter. So you don't want to prune when it's already winter winter and you don't want to prune when it's growing in the summer. Um, the only things I recommend to prune on your tree is if the branches are dead, dying, or damaged, and you're sure of these facts, then take it off. So if you have an obviously dead branch, especially when it's young, it's not huge, it's not a structural issue, you can go on out and cut off that dead branch. Um, if, if something broke your branch, as you can see in this one here, you know, I'm going to remove that broken branch. Um, but you want to avoid flesh cuts when you're doing it. So a flesh cut is cutting directly beside that trunk of the tree. You actually want to leave like about an inch of after like the side where you cut so that the tree can kind of build a natural defense mechanism around the cut. If you cut right up against the trunk, you're going to expose it to more damage. So you want to give it a little bit of extra room. Um, it should be done. and early winter or late fall. You don't want to do it in the dead of the winter and because you won't be able to tell really what's alive and what's dead. And you don't want to do it when it's growing because it's going to mess up its growing cycle. And you never, ever, ever want to prune the leader. So this tree doesn't have a great example, but the leader would be either kind of right here or right here. You never want to cut those tops off. Like I said, if you want more information about pruning, um, there's lots of information on the internet about it. I'm not going to get into it with you guys today. Um, but there's lots out there to learn from. And once your tree gets to a certain size, um, you won't be pruning yourself anyways, but you can get an arborist to come out and prune. Uh, if you have a city tree, so it's on the boulevard side of your front lawn, the city will actually come out and do any pruning. So you can reach out to urban forestry. They have like a a request line on London, City of London's Urban Forestry, and you can actually make a request for your tree to be pruned if it's a city tree. So on the other side of the sidewalk from you. Um, and they'll come out and prune it for free for you if it's on your own property and it's large and you're seeing some damage or some issues, you can get an arborist to come out. Staking. So the most important thing is you only want to stake your tree for like the first year or two after you plant it. Never do you want to keep a tree staked for more than two years. It becomes more detrimental for its growth if you leave it on. Um, so you, the year you plant your tree, you can stake it and you can leave it on for one, two years max. The best way to stake is in this image here. You're going to do two stakes on either side of it. You want them to be parallel to the wind direction. So you don't want, um, you want the wind to basically blow past the ties. You don't want the wind to blow into the ties. And um, you're going to use a stretchy tape. You can use twine as well, but you can get a specific stretchy tape at a nursery, a garden center. That's the best for this. And you're going to wrap it in a figure eight so that it doesn't pull on your tree. So your tree might still move a little in the wind. It's going to help hold it straight, but without tugging. And it gives it room to move around with the figure eight there. Uh, and you want to make sure that your stakes are wider than the root ball of the tree. So if you do it right when you plant it, it's very obvious where you planted the tree. It's how wide your roots are. And you can just do them a little outside of that. Um, like I said, um, you only really want to stake the first year or two after you plant. If you're getting a tree that's like been in the ground for a few years and it's getting really, really saggy and it, you feel like it needs to be staked. Um, once again, my suggestion would be to reach out to an arborist and, and get them to help you out with it instead of trying to stake an established tree on your own. All right, so as promised, we're gonna talk about some winter specific care today. If you have a new tree or even some older trees and you wanna get them ready for our cold, cold, cold Southwestern Ontario winters, I have some tips for you. Um, so what happens in the winter? Basically, as your leaves begin to shed and change color, it's important to prepare our trees for freezing temperatures. Uh, in the winter, the roots of your tree remain mostly inactive, but they still might grow a little bit during the months and they might still be doing some nutrient transfers. So they're still doing some work down there under the ground, even though there's no leaves anymore. Um, but like, it, like I was mentioning, your tree is mostly dormant in the winter. So basically it hibernates, it goes to sleep, it builds up enough sugars all through the summer to just last the winter and comes back out in the spring. Um, I had another cool little interesting fact I'd written down here. So some tree species actually produce their own kind of 
uh, antifreeze, basically a, a natural one internally that helps them protect from the cold weather and has they have a really good cold tolerance for it. Some of the ones that do this you might know of is a red dogwood, different willow varieties and a paper birch tree. Um, so it helps to improve their cold tolerance and uh, they use the sugars to stop water from freezing inside of them or around them so they don't rupture and ruin any of their plant tissues. Um, and so they can survive up to like negative 45 degrees, these trees. You'll find them kind of like as you go north, you'll see lots more paper birches for that reason. Just thought that was cool. All right, so some winter specific care. One. Don't plant your trees in the winter. You do not want to plant your tree once the first snowfall or frost occurs. Um, it's best to wait until the spring again if you have a tree in a pot instead of planting it when it's winter. You don't wanna plant when it's inactive and put it in a new home. It's gonna shock it because it's gonna enter a new area. You want only to plant them when they're active and able for their roots to start establishing in the ground you've put them in. Um, don't prune your tree when it's totally inactive in the, in the middle of the winter and make sure that you clean up and prune before the snow. So get rid of um, all those leaves on, actually leave your leaves, like people like to rake your leaves, I say leave them. But make sure that anything you did need to prune, if there's any dying branches, you're gonna want those cut off before winter comes so that the snow doesn't break them. You're going to want to provide uh, the trees with more mulch. So we talked about mulching, the importance of mulch. A good time is in November to make sure you have that good layer of mulch on the ground around them. It's going to provide a nice barrier and blanket around the ground to insulate the tree. Um, you're going to water, like I already talked about, once a week until the ground freezes. Um, wrapping trees. So I get asked about this. It's not something I very strongly recommend. Most trees don't need to be wrapped. It's when you see them like in the burlap, um, except for a few varieties of cedar trees. So sometimes you'll see, and not typically the native ones, but if you get from a garden center, like an emerald cedar, uh, they're not really from here and they're really susceptible to sun scalding. So if you have some of those emerald cedars or different cedar varieties, um, you might want to wrap them in a burlap. The important thing when you're wrapping your trees is to never wrap them in something that is darker in color than the trunk of the tree would be. So you wanna avoid like a really dark paper or anything black and get like a light brown burlap if possible. Um, I don't recommend it for very many native trees but some of the cedars really like it. So you can, you can wrap a cedar tree up just like kind of around the main base of it up until like you wouldn't wrap it any higher than you are tall. And then you're going to want to prevent animal damage. So animal damage happens the most in the winter. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I can tell you um, some ways and how you're going to prevent it. So you can use physical barriers, tree collars, like I already mentioned. Um, you can also use some repellents. I'll talk a little bit more about different animal repellents that we suggest um, in a few slides here. So those are some winter specific care that you can do to prevent these winter specific damages that can happen to native trees here in southwestern Ontario. Um, so the main damage types you're going to see in the winter is uh, cold damage. So it can actually dry out, get really cold and start to desiccate on the inside. Um, a winter drought, so there's moisture loss in the soils and it can dry out your tree. There can be different root injuries. So the freezing of the soil around your tree can limit its ability to take up nutrients. Uh, you can get frost heaving, which is like when your, your soil kind of swells up from the, from the ice forming in it if your soil's too wet. Sun scalding is when your tree um, either gets like a sunburn from the, the exposure to too much sun in the winter because there's not as much shade around from other trees. Um, it also is kind of refers to when the tree heats up in the sun, in the hot, hot sun, and then cools down quickly again at nighttime. And so you'll actually get um, like rapid ice production in and around your tree um, because it got warm, all the liquids and the nutrients and everything in like in and around your tree defrosted and then it froze again. It's the same reason why we get cracks in the sidewalks, right? From that like freeze thaw that can damage your tree in the same way. So you might get some different cracks or tears in your tree from, from the th freeze thaw cycle. Uh, and then animal damage, which we talked about you wanna prevent. So these kind of damages can mostly 
be prevented by the things we talked about before. So a good layer of mulch to blanket in your tree so it doesn't dry out. Not watering once the ground freezes, that you don't have too much water freezing around it. You want to make sure um, that you cut off any dead limbs and branches so that they don't break off in the in the winter in the snow. So you want to make sure your tree's ready for heavy, heavy snowfalls on it as well. And sun scalding, um, it might just happen, but if you choose the right tree in the right conditions, so if your tree's ready for full sun, and it's in full sun in the winter, that helps it a lot. Also, like I said, with those cedar trees, you can throw a burlap wrap around it and that will help prevent some sun scalding. Um, and then salt. So salt is a really big common thing um, that damages trees here specifically in Southwestern Ontario because we use so much of it on our roads and our streets. Um, so I just have a little chart here of some different salt tolerant species. You can also Google this. I just got it from a quick Google search. Um, so this can help you select the right tree. If you're going to be planting, planting a tree in your front lawn and you know that you're near the road or that there's going to be salt in your driveway, you want to prevent um, planting trees that have a really low salt tolerance. So if you're going to be in the front, you're near, near a road, you're going to want to choose a more salt tolerant species. So another thing to take into consideration. Um, so red maples, everyone loves them. They get that beautiful red fall color. They're super susceptible to salt. Um, so I never recommend a red maple for the front, for instance, tuck it in the back away from anywhere that salt will touch it. So those are kind of my winter specific things, making sure that your tree is just ready. Um, I'll talk about it with pests and I'll mention it here too, is that the best form of protection against anything is a healthy tree to begin with. So if you've chose the right tree, if it's local and native, if it's planted in the conditions it wants to be in, if you've taken care of it, if it hasn't gotten injured, it has mulch, you know, those types of things, a healthy tree is gonna be able to withstand a lot of different things. If your tree is healthy and happy, it can handle drought, it can handle the winter, and it can even combat some of these different pests and diseases. Um, so st starting with meeting those conditions is really, really a tree in the right place. I'm about, is my tree dying? Is, is my tree going to die? So I'm going to talk about some pest diseases. I, if your tree might be dying, just a few little tips and tricks so that you can make educated decisions on when to contact an arborist or reach out for external help. Or if your tree's young enough, just pull it out of the ground yourself. If she's dead, not going to make it. Um, so some, some key things to look at for if your tree is dying is, um, is there loss of barks, bark or cracks in the crunch? So if you're seeing like, you know, not on a birch tree, but a regular girl fashion maple tree, you're seeing just swatches of bark peeling off and falling off. It's a bad sign. You might want to get your tree looked at. If it's, you know, late spring, early summer, and there are not very many, if any, healthy leaves on that tree, if they're all coming in brown or didn't really come in, um, you might want to get your tree looked at. And this is uh, typically for like few healthy leaves. It's if greater than one third of the tree doesn't have leaves. So that's kind of the rule of thumb there that you want to think of. If more than a full third of the tree doesn't have leaves, um, your tree might be dying. So um, like I said, if your tree is really young and you have reason to believe it's dead or dying, uh, you can try to repair it or you can pull it out. If your tree's old and dying, call an arborist. Uh, if you have no new growth in the spring and summer, if there's no buds coming in, no new branches, not a good sign, call an arborist. Um, and then if you're getting a lot of mushrooms at the base of your tree, so this one isn't always a bad sign, but if you see a lot of mushrooms and one of the other things I just mentioned, might be time to call an arborist. Um, kind of like when to go to the doctor, right? So, oh, I have like this weird spot on my leaf, probably not bad. Oh, I only have a third of the tree with leaves, probably bad. Um, the scratch test that it mentions here is kind of also my number one go-to on is your tree alive or not. So if you have a little baby sapling, you can just do it with your fingernail. You're just going to take a twig and literally like scratch a little bit of the bark off. And if underneath the bark is green still, that means that your tree is still exchanging nutrients. It's still doing what it's supposed to do. And she is alive. If you have a bit of a bigger tree, it's older and you want to know, you may want to take out like a, 
a knife of sorts and actually kind of cut into and under the bark and under that first layer of tree under the bark and see if it's green underneath. Same thing, if you're seeing green, it's still alive. So that's like the first step is always to do the scratch test um, to see if it's still alive. If there's not green under the bark of your tree, under that first kind of layer of tree, then you're gonna want to, to call an arbor. Is my best advice. <laughs> Call an arborist if your tree is dying. They're like tree doctors. Um, there are some options for more affordable arborists. I suggest my our suggestions organization is CLC Arborists here in town. We've worked with them before. Um, oh yeah, so here's a picture of the scratch test. You can see how deep you want to go. It's just literally right under the bark. So this tree um, might, might not be able to see as well on your screens, but it is green, healthy, alive. This tree not green, not healthy, not alive. So always do your scratch test. Um, so these are just some kind of indicators. And like I said, they're not the be all to end all. They're not a definitive, oh no, my tree's dying. But these are like the main symptoms where I'm gonna be like, it's time to call for backup. So if you're just seeing a few of the other things I'll get into in the further slides, some different damages, your tree might be fine, maybe add some fertilizer, mulch it up, make sure it's getting water. You know, a little bit of leaf wilting's fine, a little bit of tar spots on your leaves are fine. But if, if you're not getting new leaves or new growth, that's when you have to start worrying. And especially if you have a bigger, older tree and it's starting to die, it can become a safety hazard. So you really wanna make sure you're checking that your tree is still alive, making sure that it's growing new leaves and new branches every year. Um, another common thing is chlorosis. I see it a lot. Once again, I was talking about the red maples and their salt tolerance. Red maples are very susceptible and chronically get chlorosis. It is a um, yellowing of leaves due to a lack of chlorophyll, which means that your leaves don't have the proper ingredients to be doing photosynthesis as well. Chlorosis can be caused by many different factors. We don't really have um, you know, a rhyme or reason or be all to end all reason but it's typically due to nutrient deficiencies or the wrong soil pHs for your tree. Um, if they had a really, really bad drought that it went through, it doesn't have good drainage. It can be caused by your soil being too compacted. Um, there's a number of different reasons that would lead to your tree not producing enough chlorophyll, um, but it's not really good for your tree and untreated chlorosis will start to kill your tree because it's not performing photosynthesis correctly. It's not getting the right nutrients. It's gonna die down on producing sugars. Um, so it's really important. Uh, some treatment you can try on your own is to try fertilizers. Uh, Reforest London, we always suggest natural fertilizers. So a compost um, or a natural mix that you get from a garden center and not a chemical fertilizer. Uh, it's better for the ground, better for the tree, better in long-term, better for the insects, so on and so forth. Um, so try fertilizer. If you're seeing chlorosis and you've never watered your tree, maybe try giving it a little bit of water. If you've been watering your tree and you're seeing chlorosis, try a little less. Um, and if you have really severe chlorosis, so you're in this bright yellow color on a tree that's supposed to be green, you're going to want to call an arborist there as well, and they can help work out a plan on how they're going to treat your tree. They'll be able to determine um, if there's something wrong with the roots or the soil compaction for you. Um, so it's just something to look out for. I see it a lot on the city trees. I always call them in, but look out on your own property for, for any chlorosis as well. So moving on from how to spot a dying tree, we're gonna talk about some common pests and diseases here in Southwestern Ontario. Um, how to spot them and if there's a treatment for them. And we're just gonna talk about all of these different things to help you identify if your tree might have one of these. So the first one is the Japanese beetle. If you're a gardener, you might be very, very familiar with these bad boys. They're, uh, they're an invasive beetle um, here in Ontario. They're from Japan, as you may have guessed from the name. There are metallic green heads with these multicolored kind of oil slick looking bodies. Um, sometimes from far away, they look more brown, but as you get close, you'll see that oil slick multicolored and very, very bright green head. And um, a sign of them is that you'll see your leaves will be skeletonized. So just like this, they don't eat the vein, they'll leave the veins of the leaves and they just eat all the bits in between. So you'll kind of have a skeleton of a leaf left over. Um, 
They typically won't kill a tree. Like I said, if you have a good, happy, healthy tree, that's the best defense against everything. Um, but maybe your tree's already struggling or it's really young and you're having bad Japanese beetles, you're gonna wanna get rid of them. Um, the best way to get rid of Japanese beetles right now is physically hand removing them. Um, you wanna drown them in a little bit of dish soapy water. So I have them in my garden. I go out with like a little yogurt container. I put soapy water in it and I go around and I literally just knock them all off into the water, leave them there for a day. They die and you just dump them back onto the ground in your compost pile or in the back of your garden, whatever. Um, they like to go on the undersides of leaves. So if you know you have them, but you're not seeing them, try looking underneath the leaves. There's also some pheromone traps for the beetles. Um, there's some mixed reviews on them though, because they've been found to maybe attract Japanese beetles to your yard instead of just trapping the ones you already have. So mixed reviews on the pheromone traps, but they do exist if you wanted to try them out if you have a big problem with them. Uh, another way to get rid of them is you can apply nemato nematodes in the spring and fall. Um, Nematode is a, a small organism that they don't like. Um, there's only one type of nematode. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it. That is good. You can buy nematodes typically at a good garden center. So I think Heman sells them. Um, Parkwood Garden Center here in town, you know, call around and check out your garden centers for nematodes for Japanese beetles. A lot of times they'll know what you're talking about because they're dealing with it. Uh, also, there have been new research showing that geraniums have toxic effects on Japanese beetles, only the native wild geranium species. Um, so that's the herb Robert or the Bicknell's, Bicknell Cranesbill uh, variety of geraniums. So you can also try planting geraniums around and they'll get rid of your Japanese beetles if you're having a problem with them. Um, so this is the LDD moth. Uh, it was formerly known as the European gypsy moth, um, but the name has been officially changed to LDD. These were really, really bad the last couple years in Ontario. Um, I'm sure everyone on this call knows what they are. They are these big gross caterpillars. They get almost as big as my finger with, they have specifically six to 10 blue dots on the front of the head and then the rest of it is red. They are long. They are these papery moths and they, um, they, this year, like they're really active in the spring and they're those caterpillars. Like if you're walking in the pinery or any other trails, you could literally hear them eating the leaves. They were falling out of trees. They're everywhere. And they're a huge nuisance. Um, it's non-native species from Europe and it feeds on a variety of different trees, but really specifically has been taking a liking to, to the oak trees here. Um, it's pretty firmly established right now in North America, so there's not in plans of removing them. We just have plans of mitigating the risk from them um, because the removal is no longer possible. They're doing way too well. Some ways that you can remove or prevent these LDD moths is um, egg scrapes in the winter. So in this image here on the bark, this is what their eggs look like on the tree. They're kind of like these soft little patches of, of eggs on your tree. Um, if you can reach them, you literally just wanna scrape those off into a bag and dispose of them. Um, you can use insecticides, but we don't recommend using insecticides. We recommend the natural method as much as possible. Uh, and then the other ways that you can remove or prevent them is to put in the early spring, you can wrap burlap around the, like a whole way around the bark of your tree. And that prevents the caterpillars from being able to climb back up or down the tree. Um, so basically they put their egg sacs lower and then when they hatch, they and they're really, really bad. Like I said, like in a year to three years, your tree will die. They're not really preventable. We don't, or they're not treatable. We don't have a treatment for them. Um, so at the time, at this time, the basically in Ontario, we've some ash trees, we've stopped transport, transporting any ash wood. Um, and so the only, the only way to do it is to, to not have ash trees for a while and let them die, die up themselves. 
The blue ash tree has been shown some resistance to it. It has a thicker kind of cell wall that the, the larvae struggle to get through. Um, do I have some signs? Aha, so here are some signs that you have an emerald ash for. First of all, do you have an ash tree? Ash trees have seven leaflets on them. So they're very easy to identify if you have a tree with five or five to seven. Um, so you wanna make sure you have the ash tree first. You're gonna look for these D shape exit holes. They look like a D. If you're seeing those on your bark, that means that you had larva exiting. If you're seeing the leaves die off in the upper third, the top of your tree will die first on your ash tree. If you're seeing a lot of leaf dying or leaves not growing anymore, big sign of ash borers. If you peel off the bark and you see these under your bark, this is definitely from an emerald ash borer. And this bottom one, if you have an ash tree and you're seeing a ton of shoots coming out from the bottom like this, that's the tree in complete panic mode trying to send out shoots because it knows it's dying. Um, so that is probably also a sign that you might have emerald ash borer. Once again, only on an ash tree. Um, and they've pretty much obliterated most of the ash trees. So you probably won't see them a lot, but your best bet is to try not to grow any ash trees. If you have ash trees growing and they're, they're making babies in your lawn, honest to God, pull out, pull out any of the baby ashes. We don't want to give these trees any more um, we don't want to give the emerald ash borer any more trees to eat. That's the best mode of, of preventing right now is to just dry them out with no food. Um, there is one type of bioinsecticide that they've found to be a little bit useful if it's detected early enough in the ash trees, but it's not fully effective yet um, and it's not being used on a wide scale. Basically done for. Um, don't plant ash trees, please. All right, so another big thing that is a pest to your tree are animals. Deer, rabbits, and other critters love to eat trees. Um, in the winter when food is more scarce, you'll find that animals are gonna eat the bark and under the bark of your tree, as you can see in this image here a lot. Um, and this is because there's sugars under the bark. And this is especially when the tree's young because it's really easy for them to chew through the bark. So if you picture a hundred year old tree, a nice thick bark layer, it's gonna be harder for a deer to munch through it. But if your tree's under 10 years old, the bark is still really, really soft and an animal can come on up and nibble. They're gonna get to those sugars when they're really hungry in the winter specifically. Not only, but it just happens a lot more in the winter. Um, they also, if you are in an area with deer with antlers, they love to rub their antlers against the tree and deers love fresh new young trees, leaves and buds when they're young and they're growing a lot, they're extra tasty um, and they're at, at level for the deers to eat and they'll come on up and they just love to eat the leaves off of your trees. Um, a black cherry tree when they're young are especially bad for this, the deer love the taste of them. Um, so these are some ways in which the animals are gonna ruin your tree. Uh, this munching down here can be deer, squirrels, mice, bulls, all sorts of things will nibble on the base of your tree. So the ways that you're going to prevent this, once again, tree collars. Talked about them a bit already. Can't stress enough. We love tree collars. Put a tree collar on your tree until it fills up that bad boy. And you want to make sure it's planted firmly all the way against the base of the tree and goes all the way up to where the leaves start. If you're having problems with deers eating the um, actual leaves on your tree, you can apply a, in, or not insecticide, it's a repellent. So this one here we've used in the past at Reforest London, it's called Scoot. It's basically, um, it's paint with a bittering agent. So you actually paint it onto the bark of your tree. And then when the animals come up and take a bite, they go, oh my God, that tastes disgusting. And they stop eating your tree. Um, so you can apply it in the late fall to help over the winter. Um, another one that we use, I don't have a picture of it up here, but it's called Plant Skid. That's S-K-Y-D-D, plant skid, one word. You can buy it at hardware stores as well. Um, it's the same thing. It's not a paint, but it just has a bittering agent. That one you mix into a spray bottle and you can um, completely spray your whole tree with it. And so if you're having problems with like, eating the leaves, you can spray over the whole tree and it'll keep the deer away. Um, yeah, so 
they can be a pest. The next disease is oak wilt. So um, oak wilt actually isn't currently in Ontario, but it's in the southern US right below us. And we're pretty sure it's only a matter of time until it hits us. So I want to talk a little bit about it um, so you can keep your eyes out for it. It's a fungal disease that stops the flow of water and nutrients in affected trees. It is deadly, just like the emerald ash borer. If a tree gets infected, there's not a lot of chance that you can save it. Um, and all varieties of oak are susceptible. So it's not just a white oak or a red oak family, it's any of the oaks that can get it. Um, the symptoms you'll first see in, in May, uh, you'll basically start to see a bronzing. So you can see it in this picture here. The leaves are going to turn very early in the spring and summer before fall, a distinct bronzy color, not the typical good red or good yellow that you get. Then they're gonna wilt up um, and die. And then you're also going to see that the bark might start to get raised or it will split on the tree as well. The red oaks are more susceptible, but it still will affect white oaks. And it can spread from above or below ground. So it can spread from the roots of your tree, root to root, underground through the soils, and also in the leaves of the tree. So it spreads really, really easily, which is why it's such a big um, problem. And we're trying to keep our eyes out for it here in Ontario. We want to stop it as soon as we see it. Um, there's currently no cure, uh, but the best approach is to reduce infection by removing any diseased trees uh, and keeping any wounds on your tree closed. Like you want to, you know, keep a nice healthy tree to prevent spread into your tree. Um, this is a common disease on a tree, but this one, do to do, do, is not deadly. In fact, it's not even bad at all. So this is really common on silver maples. Um, I get asked about this one all the time at Reforest London, these tar spots on maple leaves. And they're absolutely fine. They're not harmful at all. There's no problem with them. But you're going to see a raised black spot on the upper surface of leaves. It's caused by a fungus. Like I said, it's not harmful, generally not harmful. If it gets to a point where your entire leaves are infected with the tar spots, it's gonna prevent a lot of um, photosynthesis from happening and not going to be good for your tree to get nutrients. But typically you're only gonna have a few. To prevent it from getting worse, your best bet if you have tar spots is to rake up the leaves and move them away from the tree. So actually dispose of them to a yard waste um, center instead of leaving them to overwinter in your own property. Um, just to prevent them from spreading because they're a fungus, um, but they're generally fine. They don't look super pretty, but they're not going to kill your tree. Um, and yeah, you just want to make sure that you rake up those leaves with tar spot. You can use fungicides on them, but it's generally not recommended because the fungicides harsh on the tree and on other plants around and the fungus isn't going to kill your tree. Another pest for your tree that is not deadly are galls. These are really, really common on hackberries. Um, these ones on this image are orange, but sometimes they're just green on the underside of your leaf. And they're abnormal grow growths that occur typically on leaves, but sometimes on the twigs, roots, or flowers. Um, and mostly they're caused by an irritation or sometimes the saliva of egg laying insects, such as aphids, midges, wasps, or mites. Um, they're not deadly for the tree. They're not like, symbiotic necessarily, but they're not going to kill your tree. They're not harming the tree. It's just a bit of an irritation. Um, they're fine and they won't kill your tree. Almost every hackberry I see in the city of London has gulls and I get asked about my hack hackberry gulls all the time. Completely fine. If you have gulls on your tree, don't worry about it. Um, so road salt, once again, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, road salt is a very big problem for trees. It increases the salinity, which decreases your tree's ability to make sugar and eat and survive. Um, it disrupts the ability for it to transport these nutrients. And it's not just a problem in winter because it gets incorporated into the soil and changes the entire composition of the soil. Um, so if you have a driveway and you're using salt in it in the past and you stop using salt, you'll still have to wait a few years until your soil is repaired from that salt that it had in them. So you want to make sure that you're not planting trees with low tolerances. I showed you that chart earlier um, near the road and near your driveway. Um, but some of them with high tolerance is junipers, aspens, and red oaks that you can put in the front and they're fine with road salt. 
um, but it, it, it's really bad for your tree if they're low tolerance to it. Um, so that's all the tree pests and diseases I have to talk about today. And I'm going to move in to the tree bylaw. I just wanted to discuss it really briefly with you to educate and empower you on understanding trees on your properties, trees in London, um, what the rules are and how to understand them. So the first tree bylaw that I will talk about is the that um, here in London we have, well, it's one tree bylaw, but it's general rules are that it prohibits a tree um, within the tree protection area or an area of distinction from being imaged or damaged by a person without a permit. Um, so in London, we have a few different tree protection areas. There's one in the Dingman Creek ESA. Um, there's a tree protection area in Meadow Lily. Basically any of our ESAs, so our environmentally significant areas, are part of a tree protection area. Not always, but typically they are. And there's a few other ones kind of more on the edges of the city where we've distinguished that this is an important forest, an important area, and important trees. Um, and you can't cut them down or, or harm them or damage them at all. And it's against the law if you do. Um, so not to encourage tattling, but if you think that someone's damaging trees in a tree protection area, uh, you should, you can call the City of London Tree Protection Office, um, or you can email them as well. You can find this information on London's Urban Forestry, London's Urban Forestry webpage. Um, and to find out the tree protection areas, the best way, if you go to the city of London's um, interactive map, they'll have a layer that actually shows the tree protection area. So if you wanted to learn more about where those are in the city, um, you can go to the city of London map and look those up. I meant to put an image on here of the boundaries of them all, but I forgot to, but um, it's really easy to find on the London city of London interactive map. Just type that bad boy into Google. Um, and then one of the layers you can choose is tree protection area. The other thing under London's tree bylaw is that any tree located on a boulevard or on the city owned section of property adjacent to the road. So sometimes that even extends to on the other side of the sidewalk, but typically it's on the boulevard road side of the sidewalk. Um, anyways, any tree on the boulevard is protected from injury of damage, injury or damage. Um, so homeowners can request to have trees planted on their boulevard in front of their houses and the city will consult with you on what type of um, tree is suitable or that you want. So you can request a variety and if they think that it will be okay there, they'll plant that species for you. Um, and then hope, I typically requests happen within one year. I don't know if they were as fast during the last two summers due to reduced capacity from COVID. Um, but if you want a tree on your boulevard, you can request it and typically within a year they'll plant it. Uh, and these trees are protected. So you cannot remove a tree that is on the boulevard. They're city owned trees. They're protected from damage and from removal from homeowners. The city can approve removal if they need to um, for construction or safety reasons, but you as an individual cannot hurt these trees. Um, homeowners will always be notified in advance when they are planting trees or replacing them due to construction. And um, also the good thing to know about these boulevard trees is I kind of mentioned it before, but because they're city trees, technically, the city is also responsible for care and maintenance of them. So if you have a large tree that you think is dying or a tree in your boulevard that needs to be pruned or maybe has one of the diseases or pests I was mentioning before, you can reach out to urban forestry and it's their responsibility to ensure that the tree is protected, safe, um, alive and pruned. Um, so you can always reach out to urban forestry about the boulevard trees. Like I said, these are the ones on the roadside, as you can see in this picture, anything that's not on your side of the sidewalk is a city tree. And depending on the area, some of them on the, like on the house side of the sidewalk, sometimes fall into city tree category too. So I live in Old East Village and I have a tree that's like right at the sidewalk and that one's a city tree as well, just due to its age and proximity to sidewalk. Um, and so those are the tree protection or tree bylaws here in London, Ontario that I wanted to inform people of. So another good way to get a tree, um, if you don't have one on your boulevard already, is to request one through the city of London. That being said, you also can't plant trees on the boulevard. So if you plant a tree on the other side of the sidewalk, um, it's not technically, I mean, it's your property, but 
it's this gray area and the city can remove those trees if there is a reason that they feel a tree shouldn't be planted there. Um, they typically won't though, but it's best to go through the city avenues to get them to plant one for you. That's all my talking points for tonight. Thank you everyone for listening to me talk at you for just over an hour here. Um, I hope you learned something new. And I just wanted to open the floor. If anybody has any questions, you can turn on your microphone and ask them out loud, or you can just pop them into that chat box. Um, so any questions from anyone or anything you want me to clear up? Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm glad that you enjoyed it.